A warm welcome to you this evening, the 18th in our Art Matters series, which the Raza Foundation organizes in collaboration with the IIC. <coughs> in this, we bring together speakers from various creative disciplines and also try to include not only critics and thinkers but also practitioners of the various arts. Today we have four distinguished speakers. Shamsul Rahman Faruqi, who is a very widely known and regarded scholar but has come out with a big surprise having produced what I think is perhaps the greatest Indian novel in the last 25 years. Kai uh, Sare Asma, which has been translated also into English. And Shamsur Rahman Faruqi, of course, has been a great scholar of uh, on, who has written on Meer and on other poets and on Dastan Goi. He also edited uh, a very innovative journal for many years called Shab Khun from Allahabad. We have Ranbir Kaleka, Ranbir Singh Kaleka, uh, who actually delves in the unknown more than perhaps the others. And uh, unluckily he hasn't brought any images otherwise, uh, but he has come in spite of the fact that he is uh, not keeping too well. Among other things, he has developed a back pain. So we are very grateful that he, has, in spite of that, he has made it. Then we have Rukmini Bhaya Naya, who also combines creativity with scholarship. Uh, she has written, ex she is a linguist by, by profession in some sense, uh, teaches in the IIT Delhi, but for our purposes, writes very good poetry. And then we have Sushma Bahel, uh, who worked for a long number of years with the British Council and helped us all to go uh, to London on British expenses. Uh, but that is not a belated uh, gratitude. <laughs> but she has, uh, in the meantime, developed as an art promoter and as an art curator. So we have these four distinguished persons. The rules of the game are that they will each speak for about 12 minutes each and then if need be speak to each other and then we open it to the house. Ideally we should finish by 8 o'clock uh, which is about an hour and a half from now. Now, coping with the unknown, I don't myself know how to cope with this theme, which I selected myself. Uh, the unknown can be uh, seen in many ways. It can be said that all arts are in some ways forms of, of knowledge, of knowing. And, but that is said about love also, that love is a way of knowing. So uh, maybe uh, arts are also a form of knowing. And all arts in some way resonate the unknown. Uh, that they, the one which is not within the geography of the known, already known. There might be periods which have gone unknown in our public memory. And I'm reminded of Shamsul Rahman Faruqi's novel, which deals with the late 18th century and early 19th century, uh, with characters and trends in history, which at least, although I claim myself to be a reasonably well-read citizen of India, I did not know about. So he brings through his great fiction that which has gone unknown, although existed. Then there are elements which, which, uh, which one can say that the, the geography of the known keeps on being pushed all the time by the arts to include that which was unknown. So, unknown is 
can be described in many different ways, can be approached in many different ways. And since I have a bad throat anyway, uh, I'm not going to uh, harangue you any further. Uh, but since uh, I think uh, Sushma Bahel has a PowerPoint or something, whatever the damn thing is called, uh, may I request Sushma Bahel to start? They should. I think it's wonderful opportunity to meet all of you and to have this chat. But I must say you've been very unfair to me in making me speak first because the topic is so, such a, so it's like a quiz and I didn't know what to say and I thought okay the others will speak first and then I will know what to say and what not to say. You know I'll get some cues. So you've been a little unfair to me but let me try and you know sort of attempt it all the same. It was difficult because I went to the net and I said, you know, what would come under this theme? And all the net offered me were these advices that, you know, various people who work in companies, executives, bankers, how they cope with stress and how they cope with the risk element in their businesses. So there was very little that it offered for somebody who was like uh, trying to look at it from a creative point of view, from the point of view of an artist. So I thought, okay, you know, I'll now see what others say and then take a cue. But, you know, I haven't been able to take advantage of that. Bindu, the dot, which is the starting point for life, for universe, for everything that happens around. So the unknown, starting with a dot, something that Raza Sahab has been working on for a very, very long time and I thought I'll start with just that. And I didn't include any of your work, Ranbir, because I thought you'll have your own. So you'll excuse me for <laughs> not having included that. And I just thought the best way for me would be to look at some of the artworks that I have either uh, shown in various exhibitions that I've curated or I have understood or I have tried to understand and analyze this issue from that point of view. And I, this artist, you know, again how the artists who work in traditional forms have tried to cope with the unknown of contemporary trends. You know, here is this gentleman who works in Bikane style and he's got this work where uh, Hanumanji is sitting on this uh, stool made out of this uh, spiraled uh, tail. So I found this interesting and I thought, you know, this is his way of coping with something that he didn't know, he didn't understand, but tried, struggled and did it, somehow managed it. So I, again, these are some of the things that I could find on the net. Uncertainty is the only certainty there is and knowing how to live with insecurity is the only security. I thought that again was a good statement. So uncertainty like death is an unavoidable part of life. Yes, we all know that. Then why this fear, I wonder? Why this fear of the unknown or the unfamiliar? Because we all want to know what is in, in, in store for us rather than suspect. If bad things are to happen and we know they are happening, it's okay. But when we don't know what's going to happen, that's when we begin to worry and take tension. And I thought, you know, again, this work by K.G. Subramaniam, who's a well-known artist, thinker, philosopher, teacher. You know, again here, I found that he used different imagery, a combination, a composition, where, you know, the, he's trying to discover or to un, unravel, you know, what is in his mind there through this work. And again, here, Atul Dodia's work with... Uh, playing cards with uh, the American president and the historic element there. When the artist starts to paint, the canvas is blank. He doesn't know what he's going to do. There's that fear of the unknown. Am I going to create something that will uh, stand out or am I going to be unable to create something that's uh, imaginative, that's communicative, that's, uh, that articulates my feeling. So he starts with that clean slate, clean mind, but gradually as he begins to paint, as he begins to draw or sculpt or use new media, things begin to uh, unravel. 
and again through a mystery in this work you know where he cuts uh, the sculpture, uh, this uh, figure out in steel metal. So even in terms of medium, the artists are trying to discover unknown or unfamiliar uh, media to create what they find exciting. <coughs> and this is a young chap from Jaipur, Vijay Sharma, and I found his work again, you know, the juxtaposition of the uh, sword with all those, you know, perhaps like a Bharat or an army, I can't be sure, you know, these people on horses. Again, what is he trying to do, I wonder? Because is it, again, he's trying to fathom a new area, a new domain, a new perspective? I'm not sure. And I wanted to take this work, which is like a print based on Ravi Verma's work, again using godly figures or stories, narratives, and mixing it up with contemporary popular culture is another way of unraveling the unknown. So something that has been the same for so long will never change, I think, is a myth. And ignorance, we might say, is bliss. But when you are in search of the known, unknown, or wanting to unravel the unknown, then ignorance is not such a bliss. You want to know what lies ahead. But we have to remember that nothing is forever or always the same. Just as seasons change, there's day and night, this life cycle, birth, life, death. So we have to learn to cope with the certainty of the uncertainty. We know it's going to be uncertain future. Nature's fury, you know, when the floods come or the, you know, tsunamis happen, you know, at that moment one begins to fear the unknown, fear the mighty nature of, some, in some cases, God, whichever way you look at it. And of course, medical emergencies and risks are other factors which affect the artist as much as any other human beings. And of course, just as students have stress of exams, artists have stress of exhibitions. Before the exhibition starts, they wonder, is it going to work? Is my work going to be appreciated? How is the audience, how is the uh, person who comes to see the exhibition, what are the different ways in which he's, he's going to look at my work or she's going to look at my work? So there is also uncertainty in relationships for artists as well, with curators, with galleries, with other artists. So everybody has to face those things and there are hiccups in the creative tracks as well. I was talking to Pooja and she said, you know, she was at a stage where, you know, she felt her work was getting stuck and she wanted to use a new medium. And she then sort of found on her table, which were lying there for a long time, but she didn't sort of spot them and think about it, these uh, staple pins. And she decided to use them to create her art. So it was a discovery, a new medium that she came the known to an unknown domain. So there is also that reverse uh, movement of artworks that happens. And of course, Jitish Kalat's work, again, you know, using, talking about the accidents and the uh, traffic and the city life, but using it in a way that is not so familiar to us. The installation itself, it is, it offers a sensory, um, experience. So artists these days are engaging with sensory experiences which go beyond just the visual. There's sound, there's music, and there's all of that. So again, they are treading new, unfamiliar territories. And this work by Karu, which uses stone and steel, Seven Steps of Buddha, again uses a familiar theme, but presents it in a new, perhaps innovative, perhaps unknown so far to us method. It's a huge installation which looks quite engaging. <coughs> so art presents the unknown from different perspectives as we saw. It enjoins known with the unknown and unknown with the known. And creativity appears in diverse media, modes and manifestations that we saw in some of those works. It plays with complexities and uncertainties. It offers 
fresh interpretation by bringing out the unknown <coughs> under layers of things. Sometimes we see things and we don't see them. So perhaps artists, by bringing it in a uh, more uh, attractive or more packaged compositions, bring it out in the open. So multi-sensory uh, creativity I spoke about. But there are also questions. Does art actually help to manage the unknown? I'm not sure. Are there risks involved? Yes, there are, I think. Is it a problem of expectations? What do the artists expect of their work? And what will the community or the observer or the viewer or the galleries or the collectors expect of their work? Artists are as vulnerable to emer emerging threats as the company executives, I would say. They are also worried about if their work will sell, if their work will get collected, if their work will be exhibited. So there are those tensions as well. Again, this is an interesting example of art and design getting together. And again, a work that uses old scissors that Rajesh Pratap used for his fashion garments. So again, they are um, uh, engaging or entering unknown territories. So people fear worse when they fear something bad might occur than when they know something bad will occur. Similarly, artists, when they know the medium, when they know what they want to do, they find it slightly easier. I've just got these uh, little quotes, but I want to suggest that there is that elusive chase of certainty. And often people go to palmes, to astrology, they take recourse to religion, to sacrifice, religion, uh, uh, rituals, name it. You know, all those channels are pursued because people want to know the unknown. The unknown threatens them. So what, how, who, when, where, this concerns the artist as much as the rest of us. And again, there is the changing concept of art and museums. There are evolving tastes and expectations, which are all about entering, working, walking through unknown territories. Again, here I show some works which are large scale, so we are not talking just about the galleries. It is also outside. And of course, public art, which again, artists wonder, what is this? What is this all about when it's shown in public spaces? I've got these two works, which I think I've sort of done my time, so I won't you know, speak about these. I'll just run these through. This is again something I want to show. You know, very often the, um, uh, the impression or the um, what is said that artworks have to be shown individually, properly, for them to be appreciated. Here is an artist's home, which is a large home, where she's got a full collection of mix and match. So, you know, that too sometimes engages the uh, person into trying to discover the unknown. So, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I am an ignoramus, so I'm just going to speak till say because I I um, haven't got a finished presentation. I just thought I'd share some some rather inchoate thoughts with you on what this notion is um, of coping with the unknown. Of course, we all know something which Shushma said, and which is a thesis in general, that by creating forms of the unknown in art, we learn to cope with the unknown in everyday life. I mean that. So you can show any painting, read any poem, and it's symbolic in a sense of what we do not know. And in that sense, that very simple thesis is what we are all here to talk about, is art a form of maybe creating those counterfactual conditions which uh, tell us or constantly prompt us to think about what we do not know. And I want to remind you, begin by reminding you that this is a very old concern. So for example, 
if you think of the story of Sveta Ketu, Sveta Ketu Arunaya in the Upanishads, uh, there he is asked by his father, who is the sage Uddhada Kapta, he's come back from school, have you uh, learned to see the unseeable, uh, hear the unhearable, and know the unknowable? And uh, Sveta Ketu said, well, I've learned nothing of the kind. I've learned all these other important uh, things. And so his father backs him off again, and he comes back after 12 years, and his Buddha asks him the same set of questions. And Sveta Ketu says, nothing doing. And then, of course, Buddha does this, makes this very interesting move. He adopts what I would call the experimental method of showing what is unknown by saying, you know, bring me that salt, bring me that um, lota, I guess, or water. And, uh, and then he says, put the salt in the water, and next day do you see the salt? And Adalaka says, I mean, Arunia says, no. And he says, taste it at the top, taste it at the bottom, taste it at the thing. Where is the salt? It is now part of that thing which you cannot see. And similarly, he says, bring me the fruit of the, I think it's the Nyagroga tree. And he says, you know, break open the fruit and you see the seed, you get the picture. And then break open the seed and there is nothing in the seed. And he says, from that nothingness grows this great, from that unknown quantity grows that great tree. That thou art, that twam asi, that. You know, so this connection between the self and that which we cannot see, to my mind, not only illustrates um, uh, it illustrates the potency of art, but also what science has sought always to describe that the laws of the laws of nature, the things which you cannot see, but which describe the unknown, the, un, the unknown or the unseeable, the unbearable as that which is animating what is, what we think we know. So when scientists today tell us, well, you know, uh, only 4% of the universe is matter that we know can see, but the rest of it, or 96%, is dark matter. It is up to us as thinkers, as artists, uh, to interpret the cognitive valence of the dark matter which we cannot describe. So I wanted to also, I, I want to see whether, how we manage to translate these unknowables or these, these perceived unknowables into literature, into art, into poems. As, um, uh, I, um, as Ashok told you, you know, I'm a linguist, and I, I'm obsessed with words. And uh, so, uh, you know, for example, uh, if none of you in this room can do what the simplest computer can do, you cannot count the number of words in your head. You can estimate them, but you cannot count them. You do not know. You cannot know. We can only estimate, we can only approximate. And I think our best methods of approximation are in our everyday, in our everyday lives. So I think, you know, the unknown is not only part of crisis, fear, and you know, all those things which we associate with the future, what might happen, but also the unknown comes to us all the time. Everyday life is a continuous coping with the... Supposing I stop now. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen, right? So in that sense, I have created an unknown, and that is an artistic ploy. That is a structure, structural uh, element that I have created simply through the pause. And that's what I mean by the creation of the counterfactual. Now, I want to, uh, I, I have brought a quotation. Only one, not like Sushma, I'm not very well equipped. But this quotation stuck in my mind because it was by, uh, it was 
Timurid. It was something which the person whom I don't like, and many of you don't like, uh, was criticized for, and that is uh, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld. And uh, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who was, uh, you know, he was, he was some advisor, defense advisor to Ronald Reagan. And he says something interesting, which I believe is quite critical. He says, reports that say something hasn't happened are always interesting to me. He's talking about the Iraq war. Reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me. Because as we know, he said, there are no knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things we know we don't know. And there are also unknown knowns. There are unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we do not know. Now, people said, what an idiot. <laughs> and you know, is he writing poetry? I mean, what is he doing? But if you actually think of this, he is creating a matrix. He is creating a perfect Aristotelian square, which says known, known, unknown, known, known, unknown, unknown, unknown. And that matrix is what we are caught in every day. That matrix is what we psychologically play with. It, uh, with the, that gives us the structure through which we can do what Shushma was saying, you know, combine the known with the unknown. And the more you can stretch that, the more you can push at the uh, edges of that, that's when you become more and more incomprehensible, unhearable, unknowable. And I think artists challenge that boundary, that they create that psychological matrix. And I think that that matrix, you know, the matrix matrix, that is the film matrix, is something that, um, that was created to tell us that you are caught, there are things you know, there are things you don't know. But in fact, Rumsfeld's notion of known, unknown, known, known created a matrix. And therefore, I think we should see that in everyday life, even when we have fools like myself speaking, there might be just something there which will enable you to catch and play with things. I want to end with um, one other point, which is that specifically, I would say, that um, you know, um, the unknown is emotionally potent. It is not just. Uh, it is. Full, I mean, we were talking about you know, Nipunsak, Nipunsak, uh, Modi, and uh, uh, you know, uh, potency and impotency. So I wanted to say that in talking about that, I was going to talk about the the way in which the unknown houses uh, the, the in. The, the emotional part of our lives. Because why? Because it is the space of fear, uh, as Shushma said. But it is also the space of hope and desire. And so to, I know I don't want to take up too much of your time, wanted to, I, I had one painting. Because you know, Horace said, and many people have said this, as in painting, so in poetry. And as in the visual arts, so in the spoken arts. And I also, because I write, I write, I wanted to end with a poem. Actually, I wanted to end with a poem on Dara Shoko, but it's too long. So I will just end with a poem, where, uh, because I write a lot on paintings, and with a short poem on um, a Basoli painting. And uh, it's a Radha Krishna painting. And what I wanted to uh, suggest is that the painting, even though it's such a traditional painting and a traditional idiom, it's not smart installation art. It's not playing around. It actually forces you to say what's going on in this painting because of the uh, designing of the painting where Radha cannot see Krishna. Okay, so I just wanted to read you that. Do you want me to show you the, the painting? Or yeah, yeah. you can imagine yeah. the basso. Mm -hmm. That's also possible. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I can, I can try. Yes. Okay. Right, can you hear me? Yes. So I just, I, I'm going to ask you to imagine the basso painting. 
So it is um, there's a Radha and a Krishna. Now Radha is sitting there and she's kind of with her sakis and so on. And there is Krishna and he is watching her and she can't see. Uh, this, but when a modern reader bring uh, attempts, a uh, modern viewer attempts to interpret this painting, the modern viewer in engages in a kind of dialogue with the history that she does not know. She does not know where the painting came from. She does not, and she, you know, you don't often find out all of this before you watch a painting. You just like it. And you like it for its colors. And, and you know, anyway, so I thought I'll read you the, the poem. And it is partly an ima it's very short, you know, 10 lines or so. Um, but um, it's partly an attempt to engage with the painting and to take Radha's position. But it's partly an attempt to bring this painting to an imagination which was not that of the Basoli painter. So, take the yellow curving path. The trees are separate, sturdy. So in Basoli, the trees kind of are separate big trees. So, take the yellow curving path. The trees are separate, sturdy. All the storms in your heart will not bend them rather. Krishna stands behind a rock hidden by the river's fate, unable to see, and unseen by you, Radha. Love must be. These mixed colors, this suspended time, when particle joins wave and separates, separate. Kamra. You can look right into the house, spot the cook's pot, pot bellies, move from kitchen to courtyard, and then catch the palmist with the women, absorbed in the foreground, cows. Perspective and technique, tangible things, bring you to this tiny point, the world in a dewdrop, neither more nor less transient than the painter who recorded these marvels and died. And death to me is the great unknown. Thank you. Now, I think a lot that I'm going to speak about uh, very much links up with what Rukmini has said. So I do wish I had spoken before you did. <laughs> <laughs> you say some advantages of being a woman, precious <laughs> little <of> stuff. <laughs> uh, <coughs> I could, uh, I'm a visual uh, artist. Uh, so I'm sorry I didn't bring any images, uh, but I could speak about my relationship with the unknown. Uh, I can begin maybe with where does this, where does the creative process begin in my head? Uh, it may be uh, an event I have watched or a story somebody's told me or something I've read or from literature, but it's usually an event of some kind. It's perhaps uh, a certain configuration of people sitting together and that triggers something. And I say, ah, there is something meaningful here which I can work on. But don't, I don't quite precisely know what it is. But then slowly the images begin to emerge and they're more clear. Uh, now something, two things begin to happen. At some point, I totally understand what I'm going to paint. And then I if I totally understand the meaning of that, then it doesn't interest me anymore. I don't work on that. I only work on what I do not understand, or up to the point I do not understand. So I let it simmer in my head for a period of time. And if it still continues to elude me, but fascinate me, then I begin to work on it. 
But what is that unknown? I don't know. But I know uh, that it's a kind of, the word that he used, it's a kind of fecundity. It's uh, uh, so, if, okay, if I work on that configuration, say of three people sitting together, or it can be just a glass of water, uh, if, it, if it reaches that point uh, where where it seems that it's fecund with meaning, but I cannot quite get hold of it completely, but I have to arrive at a state of ease with it. So as we spoke of uncertainty, so I have to be at a state of certainty about this uncertainty. So there is, there is, uh, uh, and, and that sort of stays, in fact, that the, 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 the uncertainty in fact stays, uh, although I'm at ease with it, to the, until I have finished the work. But then, uh, when I say finish the work, I don't know if it's finished, but something happens. That is that there is a certain tension in my own body. And at a certain point, that tension in my own body eases. And that's when I feel that perhaps uh, I, have, I have come closer to what I want to do. Uh, paint what I wanted to depict, and perhaps so that is the unknown, and I would know what that unknown is. But then uh, also I could speak of something else too. Um, I wonder why why do I look at things that way? Uh, it would vary with with different um, uh, artists and creative people, writers, and so on. With me, it was so much to do with my uh, very early childhood. <coughs> It was it was spent in uh, isolation in the in the, when I say isolation well we, it was a large house family house and almost for five five years uh, I hardly stepped out of that house it was a very sheltered life um, and there was a lot of love around but we weren't very many in the in that house it was um, uh, it was a village haveli and. Uh, but it wasn't a time of, I never felt, there was no moment when I said I was bored. Every little thing, uh, every little event uh, which uh, would, would carry huge significance or would become very large in my head. But that could be something as simple as, uh, for instance, uh, at a certain point in the day, in the large courtyard, I would see a beam of light rising from the floor. And I wondered what it was, but I didn't want myself to, to discover too quickly what was the source of this light, this beam of light. And I would be about four years old, and I have very good memory of my first years, my first five years. Maybe I accumulated more in my five years than the rest of my life. <laughs> and, but I didn't go to that little spot of light for many days, uh, but would, would wait for this beam to just rise up. And one day I did go to it, uh, went up to it. It was just a little piece of mirror which got embedded while the floor was being laid. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, and then I saw my eye in it, and that again was perhaps absolutely wondrous to, to have an eye looking from the floor uh, towards me. Um, but so, that little event became huge. So living by myself, uh, being alone most of the time, there was so much to discover. There was so much. So things were felt. But now, uh, why it fascinated me? What was the meaning of it? I don't know. But certainly, it, it, there, there, there was something in me, in, in me which got fulfilled, uh, which, got, uh, which maybe pointed towards something larger. And uh, uh, this is, and then, yeah, this is how uh, I think uh, you know, my sensibility was formed. And also, uh, well, I've been for some time making video works. And in the video work too, there is, I write uh, a little script of what uh, I'm going to shoot. Uh, but then when I'm shooting, I, I do those, the, the necessary four, five, six, 10, 20 shots. But then I shoot a lot else as well. And usually the work which I finally finish is 
consists more of the work which was not in the script. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to, at this point, probably show you uh, a one-shot video clip, but I don't have it, so I can actually just describe it to you. Uh, in, in one of the works, there is a man who, and there's an empty screen, and a man walks into the screen carrying a cockerel, a rooster, and he has his reflection, a mirror reflection, which is an absolute sync with him. Mirror reflection has to be in sync with him. So he comes to the middle of the screen, uh, looks at the mirror, and he's holding in his arms this cockerel. Uh, and he arrives again at what I could describe uh, a state of ease, perhaps, and he uh, becomes invisible. And for me, that becoming invisible uh, means a kind of completeness, a wholeness, but that's created with an absence rather than with, a, with, 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 a, with any other device. Uh, then we suddenly see that the uh, man has appeared again, and we see the cockerel struggling to escape from his arms. The cockerel escapes, uh, and uh, the man follows him and uh, disappears from the, well, runs from to one side of the screen and goes out. Uh, but his reflection only very slowly drags itself after him. The man comes back again, and he's complete again with the cockerel and his uh, reflection. And, and the whole thing again continues. Uh, he disappears, and the cockerel is discovering. He loses the cockerel, and uh, he chases after it, loses his reflection, but comes back with the reflection of the cockerel. Now, uh, it all seemed just right to me, uh, seems complete to me, uh, but I don't know completely why. And uh, if I have tried to explain my works uh, in words, uh, I have always felt that I'm denuding the work. In fact, with more I say about the work, the more it gets depleted. They could, they only hints. Uh, probably little suggestions I can give towards the work. Uh, perhaps that's all I could speak today. Thank you. Thank you. It's very, very hard to compete with uh, my three speakers here, and actually each of them in their own way his or her own way, <laughs> and made my task difficult. Normally it happens that when you are <coughs> next speaker, the last speaker, you can borrow ideas. <coughs> Here, all three of you have spoken in such personal terms about the, the whatever this is, hoping to be unknown or whatever. <coughs> I, I actually thought of Ashok's Leela. He always, you see, so there's a line from me here, who is this person who brought this shibufa to open the chamandar? <laughs> because how does one, uh, I mean, how does one answer the question? The whole, the whole the scene is that someone comes and informs the road that look, you may feel yourself that you are the best and the most beautiful, beautiful thing in the garden, but there is somebody else who is better than you, who is more rose than you, who is more sweet than you. And the poet says, Ye kaun shibufa sa mm -hmm. So uh, this is a shibufa. <laughs> so our friend <laughs> Ashok Leela she comes again and again into play. So here, and I can honestly tell you that I have been trying to understand what exactly it means to say, hoping with the unknown. What is the meaning of coping? Mm -hmm. He is a linguist and a professor of poetry and so forth. He is a poet and so, I mean, there are people who are, who are better equipped than me to explain what exactly coping means. And in fact, Sushma let the cat out of the, out of the bag and she used the word managing. <laughs> managing is not coping. <laughs> managing is controlling. <laughs> managing is getting, getting hold of it or getting rid of it. But are you able to cope with the unknown? what exactly unknown is in our lives. Of course, painters and poets, we have, we, have, we have heard them and they talk about mostly about the personal experience. 
uh, that, that the, the world is unknown to them, or the work is unknown to them, as, as uh, when we were talking about this work, I was reminded of T.S. Eliot's remark that, how can I know what the poem will say unless I have finished the poem? <laughs> so, that's also another kind of unknown, <coughs> tackling, tackling the unknown of coping with them. For I tried to understand about this, this issue of coping or not coping, is that I think poets do the best in, in this area. And I talk about just two of the biggest unknowns in the world, death and love. Now, uh, and you know that death is, a, a, and these two also the most known things in the world, in fact. All of us have experienced uh, death in the family or uh, of course even in the in death ourselves and of course love and so forth. Uh, we, we, uh, I just wanted to remind you that we are living in the city of Kusra poet and musician and courtier and Sufi and historian and so forth. <coughs> what does he say about these things? Well, I think they, what they do is that they create narratives. And the, those narratives don't explain in, in terms of cut and dried explanation. <coughs> like death, for example. Now, Kusra <coughs> says, Hey gul, chu amdi bazami, go chibuna an. Rose, oh rose, as you come out, from the earth into the open. Tell us, how are they? Go, Chimunan, Aan Ruhe Ha, Ki Dar Tahe Garde Fana Those faces which have now been buried under the dust of <coughs> nothingness. Oh, this is exactly what death is. So we explain it and cope with it by saying that, look, this rose, it represents somebody who died a thousand years ago. And the rose has now come out to symbolize it or to tell us how, what things are happening there and how something must, must, be, must, must, uh, good, uh, must be happening there because there's a rose coming out here in the morning telling us good morning, here I am for you. So, I gul chu amdi bazami go chiruna. How are they now? Aanrugaya, those faces. Which were buried under the dust of nothingness. So, see, it's a narrative that nothing dies. We all die, but we live in some way or the other. And of course, if you are in Pakka, Musliman time, you will say you will go to hell or heaven according to what you have done or not done. Or then you will talk about the births and rebirths and the cycle of birth and death. And I mean, in any way, all these are just myths, just narrative. And the poet gives us a more satisfactory narrative to understand. That's all. Ayagul chu amdi badami go chimuna. Similarly, love, which is the most hard lacerating experience of, of man, perhaps, after death, or maybe even more than death. Husro again comes before us and makes fun of it, <laughs> or makes it a funny thing to say. He says, Har rose, the Ramza, kasde janam chepuni. Why is it that every day, by your coquetry, you make an attempt on my life? <laughs> what are you doing? Kya kar rahi ho tum? Then he says, Sar, sar gashto ruswai jahanam chekuni. You are making me crazy. You are making me ruswa, but naam in the whole, the whole world. Kya kar rahi ho? So this is what love is doing to him. Or to her also, who knows? But then he says, Yakshab agarat must be yabam tanha. If one night I find you drunk and alone, dhanam chekunam, I know what I will do. Gadhadhanam chekuni, I know what I will do. But if I don't know, then what will you do? <laughs> so that's how love makes you see uh, narrative for us. Makes things, I mean, we can cope with it now. Somehow, although uh, my heart may be burning with desire and unhappiness and as Ghalib said that my, the, her, the, her body doesn't even come in my dreams naked. Not even naked, not, she doesn't even pull up her, 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 her trouser ends, trouser bottoms. Her chans the joshe havasam hoon rava das dil. My heart is bleeding with the force of desire. But even in my dream she doesn't come even with the, with, with the show of her ankles. What is of, what, what are other things? So this makes me understand. How can really heart, a heart be? for things which do not happen, but which can happen perhaps somewhere in, in the end. So that's how I think, that's what I have been coping at this. I mean, I don't know about you, <laughs> you people here, you are all uh, 
friendly people and good people, and I'm sure that you enjoy it. How do you know? With the ponder. So I think this is how, uh, I, mean, I, I, I mean, I don't know really whether I can cope with things at all. But the poet makes me understand it is possible perhaps to cope, to create narratives which may not make sense in any philosophical or logical or mathematical sense, as Rukmi said. Yet, somewhere it makes you, you feel that yes, you are somewhere able to look it in the eyes. It's a humble hand. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. But now, would, would you, uh, each one of you like to react to what the others have said or seek clarification? Otherwise, we can open it to the... No, I think we have, we can visit it up and... Yeah, I someone wants to... Rukhani, do you want to say something? Add something? Well, you know, we won't be able to stop when he introduced that, so I think we'll, uh, we'll open it. Uh. Well, friends, now it's open to you to ask brief questions, witty comments, <laughs> brief, either way. <coughs> Don't give your opinion on the subject. <laughs> you heard four people already. So full of <laughs> but react to what they have said, if you want to. Yes. My question is to Rukmini. Uh, you s talked about how the artists cope with the unknown. Mm -hmm. But don't the uh, scientists have the same problem? Same. But actually, I myself believe that, you know, in there is not the kind of two cultures of sciences and arts. I think that in a way, all our narratives construct explanations. So for example, if we say, how did the leopard get its spots, which is Western thing, or it, uh, it is, uh, you know, the squirrel has this Ram ke lakir, oh. because Ram uh, stroked it, mm -hmm. then what we are saying is, this is an explanation. So I don't think that we need necessarily scientific story houses you know, scientific theory houses in order to create, uh, yeah. you know, in order to create an encounters with the unknown. Mm -hmm. Science creates encounters with the unknown in order to create a kind of community of people who ask uh, uh, scientific questions. Let me give you one answer, one lovely example. You know, Raman, um, uh, C.V. Raman in the science, is ask the question, why is the sea blue? Now to me, this is a poet's question. And a poet can uh, answer this question in a wonderful way. C.B. Raman talked about the diffraction of light. He won the Nobel Prize for this. The question is the same. And we cope with different kinds of, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of hunger, hunger epistemic hunger in the sciences and in the arts. So I think the unknown, we cope with the unknown all the time. In our everyday lives, we don't know what's coming next. And we always have, you know, like I'm always worried about my children, you know, exactly what's going to happen, is he going to come home tonight, what's good? you know, that sort of thing. And it's not only these great emotions like love and hate and so on, but I think we create encounters with the unknown as part of our language abilities. We have uh, the unknown as part of our everyday lives. And from those everyday lives and narratives, uh, we create uh, the more complex uh, conversations of the sciences and the arts. The questions are similar. The methods may be different. Both are modes of coping <coughs> with our epistemic hunger. I don't know whether that, Thank you know, you. hunger. You have it. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> no, I don't know. I don't know about coping. Or that one tries to even cope. Some one has to. Some things just happen. And I think it is your capacity to be able to recognize the happening when it happens. 
for instance, I'll give you a very personal example here. And uh, this was in, in New York. I'm coming from Tokyo, where I spent some time. And I was fascinated by um, sumi painting and sumi ink and brushes and all that sort of thing. But I knew that I was never going to be a Japanese. You know? mm -hmm. So I wouldn't go into calligraphy as such. But I carried this wonderful material with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it happened in New York. Uh, I stayed with a friend of mine, and he happened to go away that night for dinner or something and said, can you amuse yourself? I said, well, I tried. There's a, there's a, it was a, a one-room apartment, two-room, maybe, and a bathroom. So I chose the bathroom as my, uh, <laughs> my, my studio, you mm -hmm. see. And I had this paper, I unrolled it, and so on. I didn't know. I, there was no question of trying to make a masterpiece or even a bad painting or something. I said, let, let, let me just have a go at this and see how they did it, and so on. I understood how ink, for instance, with its different uh, luminosities and its depths and its, uh, yeah, all the qualities that it can have when mixed with water, for instance. But I had this trough with bath. So what I did was I cut out, uh, the, the roll was, was like 54 inches wide, but a huge roll I brought with me. So I cut up six pieces, fairly lengthy, almost the size, a little bit bigger than the, than the tub itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I spread ink on the bottom of the tub. Wow. I don't know why, I don't know. I didn't know. I mean, I was, re I was really, I was just wanting to see what would happen, you see. And then I uh, took the paper, which was slightly bigger than the tub, and then I began to press it down, thereby creating rivulets, air, 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 air pockets, which would then go down to the bottom of the tub. Now, seeing this, I thought, well, here's my opportunity now. So I took water, this big, fat, wonderful Japanese brush I had, and loaded it with water, and I pressed it against the side of the tub where the rivulet started. Mm -hmm. So the water would go and go and touch the ink and flow because there was a slight slant on it. And I was, I thought, well, isn't this marvelous, you know? I mean, I, I can create a line just by putting a drop of water here and, and a line becomes a line over there, see? Yes. Well, this grew, and I mean, I discovered various things. I could pat it down, I could put more ink through it and so on and so forth. I did one sheet, and then I, I did in the sitting room in this house, I covered the floor with mm. old newspaper because, you know, I was just then lifting these things out and just putting them one by one. And after I completed about six large pieces, which I finished in this way, and it was happening, the way I did it was I had the side of the tub, and there's a gap, I stretched the paper right down to the bottom, to the trough. So the bottom was going to have a large quantum of ink. The side was going to have relatively less. But with these water manipulations, which has yes. doing all the time, uh, they became like strings going, connectors, you see. And I put these quite unknowingly, I can tell you. I wasn't seeking any, any, anything. But I was putting these as they came out. And then after that, I just took a look at it, and the large pieces worked together with these strings going out like that, making the, the smaller piece of each one, then collating with that, making a slightly larger piece. But you had these narrow strips and large strips, narrow strips and large strips. And this became a, a fascinating, it, yeah. And it then I looked at it, and it reminded me of, of, of a, like a Bach partita, that it would just go on and on and on without repetition. But the, 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 uh, the genesis of it would create its own reverberation. Yeah. You know. 
And I was, I was absolutely struck with this thing. And uh, finally, I mean, I, uh, the danger, of course, then is that once you get to know, then the death of that is repetition. Mm -hmm. And one must then hold back. You're not going to do it again. Again. Yeah. 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 And it's happened. So you're really, you're really um, invoking, in fact, a, 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 whole, uh, a whole bit of innocence, actually, in the whole thing. You are only the, you become a factor with the ink and the pen and everything else. You're just one, one element that is functioning in <coughs> intelligence, put it that way. Can you imagine? Well, because in Asana's Jamaa, talk about repeatability. As well, the capability yes. of the experiment is not the goal to um, to achieve a kind of understanding which perhaps can bring closure, whereas the artist seems to thrive on you know on, on maintaining, on cherishing uh, the unknown, on actually cultivating the unknown, and seems to see knowability as a threat to the artist experiment. That's the sense I got from the two artists who spoke to. Where well, science seems to be driving in a very different direction, at least conventional science. Uh, I, I'm dying to respond, but I, I won't because I'm hogging the skill thing. I entirely agree with uh, what the speaker said. I'm sorry, I don't know the name. Uh, but uh, I think art thrives on keeping certain things unstated and unknown. Yeah. So that varied responses can be made to the same thing. And um, I can give a very mundane example. I don't know how many of you have seen the seven installments of the Ramayana based on Valmiki's poetry that Rukmini Devi created. Now, when she was uh, starting on this project, people told her, that that poetry is so extraordinary that no matter what you do in terms of dance, it's not going to live up to that. And people are going to be terribly disappointed. And she came to this part where Hanuman is crossing the seas and going to Lanka. And there's a big description of that. Now she said, how do I capture this in dance? And she thought the best way was to leave things unsaid. And what she has done there is to have both Ram and Lakshman standing side by side. You see Hanuman in a kind of a posture, the scene before, where he's supposed to be taking off into the air. But of course he doesn't. It's only that posture that's shown. And in the next scene, you see Ram and see, you know, see uh, Ram and uh, Lakshman look standing together and they're saying, oh, look at this, look at this. And they're making all kinds of expressions and they are pointing out to different parts of the air. Actually, nothing is being shown. Mm -hmm. And I think it is the not showing which really maintains that romance and gives that work uh, a special appeal. Because if you were trying to actualize it in terms of movement, the whole thing would just collapse. Thank you. Thank you. question to I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if you turn the question around of coping with the unknown, coping with the known. No, it yes, seems to me that, that it seems to me that it's just we have many expressions. Uh, we live life with many expressions and uh, uh, the mind has many expression and constructions of knowing existence. It actually been a big unknown. Mm. The fact we call dark matter dark matter is the binary of the unknown because mm. we, we, if we define it so. By yes. definition, yes, absolutely, and it's a naming. It's a naming, and you know this famous thing when when quantum physics was started out, mm. Einstein said, "God doesn't play dice because he mm. said this doesn't exist." And of course, mm. now we talk about quantum computers now, mm. not to, so of pattern computing, almost much for <laughs> So it is a. We have only some tentacles into knowing, and some ways in which we can know, and there are many ways to know poetry art. Mm. Science, yes. the all systems are different. But maybe we should say coping with the knowing. That's, that's what uh, we normally do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, can, I, can I just uh, try to link these questions, unless somebody no, no. else says? Actually, when I was listening to Krishankarna, I was thinking, you know, 
in terms of I, this idea that um, science leaves wants to define everything but, or as clearly and precisely as possible and art leaves things unknown is to me a very modern construction. It's an enlightenment construction. What I was saying is that our need for talking about the phenomenon world is far older and far more uh, far more deep psychologically than the constructs of modern science. So this is one way of constructing science and arts. But you may actually be dealing with the same sorts of um, epistemic um, um, areas. Uh, let me just say, you know, in terms of when I was listening to Krishan Kanna, what struck me is that, you know, we say, there's another modern thing, discovering is what science does. It goes out and finds patterns in nature. Invention is what art, uh, you know, the artist does. They find things, they make things, they don't want to replicate these things, right? But in fact, you discovered something. And then that discovery stimulated you to understand, invent a pattern. And then you said, you know, my self-realization, my self-image is that I should not actually replicate this thing, because that, in a way, uh, puts me into this mode where I am known. However, I think that the problem, I, I have a question about that. My question is to you and to all artists. One of the most important things about the individual artist in modern art is that they have a recognizable style. We say this is a Jamini Roy, this is a Jackson Pollock, this is a Mondrian, and what we have there is actually replication. What we have there is actually a different aspects of uh, repeating. Exactly itera, in Sanskrit itera, iteration, repeating. So it's not as simple as, you know, science, so self-image is you know, uh, just have a replicable experiment. And art self-image is don't have it. In the notion of the signature of the artist, that recognizable style, that method, you have something like Indra, Sanskrit Indra, iteration, repetition. So I, I'm puzzling. I mean, I write about these things, so I'm puzzling. I'm not saying it's a set thing, but I think we shouldn't jump onto this thing where we say science deals with the known, art deals with the unknown, these are the things, because I think that creates the kind of mentalities where we are trapped in reification, reification of the arts, reification of the sciences. I think we need more humility, you know, I really do, uh, in, in, in our quest. Because we're very, um, we're very limited creatures. Well, we try and get above that, you know. We try and, I mean, it's a, it's a question of having to recognize that you've done something. And then, of course, the temptation there is to, my God, I've done it, so I could repeat it. I could. And now, uh, that, 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 then, then you're entering into a kind of a rat race with yeah. yourself, actually. Yeah. I mean, not That's a real danger for scientists as well. Want to do that. Specialization. It's called no, expert but what is, I mean, I think it's, it's, it's a little more complicated. Mm, it's very complicated. Because you, you, you make something, you see something. Now, you don't, want to, you don't want to replicate it because there is that prohibition on yourself as well. But what you do, what you mm. do see is mm. further extensions of it. That's right. Now, then that's when, what the science so does. With, so when you talk about style, and actually style is only to be measured or to be seen right at the end of one's tether, at the end of one's life. Mm. Because you go on changing and you go on adding it, and, and you know, there's, no, you, there's no one thing that's called you. style, you see. Uh, no, no, there isn't. I know that. Yeah. But you know that shock of recognition? Oh. 
Oh, it's wonderful. I saw it. Yeah. You know, this, I recognized it. And you know, you saw, see something. It's like recognizing a person in the painting. I think it's a very interesting debate, this unknownness, you know, which I think is, therefore, thank you, Ashok, despite putting us all in a spot. <laughs> you know. um, so when the apple falls down, is between an artist? <laughs> I think it is. I think it is. It's a mind that art. Yeah. We, we, we have uh, learned this evening what, what, how do the artists, the poets, and authors deal with the unknown. But every human being deals with the unknown. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah. It's an everyday thing. Coping with the unknown. Every moment of his life. Yes, every the next second. moment one doesn't know what is in store for you. That's true. And that unknown becomes known the next moment. You know, so I want to know one. the next moment. The next moment I know what it was here asking. So this matrix which you have talked about, known, unknown, it, it, it's so you know, it's so ubiquitous related. and everyday. Yeah, every it's so related. Day. Mm -hmm. Whatever is unknown becomes known. But I mean, when but the artist says that the painting is unknown, you know, but it is not unknown as he has explained. Yes. Within yeah. himself, he knows what the painting is about. It is unknown to you. Interpretation. That's a very very questionable statement. No, 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 my life, you see, is unknown to you. Yeah. But the next moment is known to me. You know, so well, similarly. That's yeah. too simple. No, no, sure. I mean, this is a very, very interesting topic. Which yeah. you take it, sir. Now I'm just going to say something about science, but don't science, yeah. scientific truths have refutability built into them? Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise there's no science. There should be possibility of So, you know, I'm sorry to have dragged this into the direction of science. Actually, I wanted to intervene here because everybody seems to be much in love with science. I want to know, I want to say, that all that science does is to make unknown things even more unknown. And now we are talking, as you said, our friend here said, about multiverses. But actually, I was reading, I was reading and rereading the recent book by Stephen Hawking and Leonard yeah, yeah. the grand design. And uh, although I think that I have read a lot of uh, popular science and everything, but still I found that the book was very hard for you to understand. But I could understand this thing: that things can happen. In, in different ways, in different universes, at the same time. Yeah. So then, I don't know how you are saying that the science will solve any problems for us. <laughs> or the science will tell us more about the universe. The, whatever they, as Freeman Dyson said, the more I think about the universe, the more I doubt why, why it was created. Yeah. So I'm not sure that science is going to help us that no, way. We don't want help. And I, no, no, you want help. You see, <laughs> our friend says that you, he, he doesn't know my personal life, I don't know his personal life. So, so the coping with drinking and coping with eating and coping with going to the bathroom is a different thing from coping with the reality of death, the reality of love, which shares your life forever and ever. And the only thing that, that, that I can do is that when he does that, she dies on the body. Right, right? <laughs> yes, it's unbearable otherwise. <laughs> I don't know. It may be unbearable, I, but, but my point is that please don't don't believe that the scientist is going to be. No, to why do should we be favor? It's you, it's it actually you and I ourselves. Nobody's suggesting that. Nobody's suggesting that. Name, sir? Nobody's suggesting that. Just to answer question, okay. Mike, Mike. So, you made those paintings, but then your friend came. And. Hold it closer to you. I think it's off. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is science for you. This is, this is science for you. <laughs> After the painting is made, we are made, uh, suddenly okay, you, know, you waited for, or the friend came and asked you, what are these things? Uh, he recognized, he made some sense of it. And similarly, when you write a poem, it's just not tucked away in a drawer. It is presented <coughs> to a reader somewhere, and that reader has to deal with that unknown, so that the the audience uh, is also coping with 
uh, in a way. And I, you know, and then you raise this issue of adoration. And I, it seemed to me that if I were to see, or somebody were to see, if someone just as an individual see a painting by Demi Nero, just one painting, uh, it may not make that too much sense. sense. That, that, sense. Not the that same much sense. sense. <clears throat> but if that person, no matter how, you know, non-artistic and so forth, uh, goes through a room for him, he would get a sense of what Roy was struggling with, what Roy is trying it to do. We will have some opinion, some understanding. So I think that iteration is not only creating the, you know, the, but also in, yes. in the communication yes. device yes. also That's right. creating That's point. and gives an, uh, uh, and makes it possible for the audience, for the lay person, for the person who just enjoys poetry to see, ah, this is a yeah, I think that's very important. Yeah. Important point. When the limit goes, eight o'clock. <laughs> so thank you very much, all of you, both the panelists and the artists. May I offer them some flowers mm -hmm. and announce that the next art matters would be on urban chaos and the arts. <laughs> on 20th March, we have three speakers lined up already. Ravi Agrawal, Ritish Nandra, and Ina Puri. And we're looking for a fourth one. We hope to, to, to get him right. to the net before the event. And thank you very much for coming. for being the yes. most talkative this evening. <laughs> <laughs> for being the first to be. <laughs> for being the last to be. <laughs> yes. For being really aware. <laughs>